Ah! Oh. These stories really have their own sort of legs. They just wander around and go every which way, sometimes in the most beautiful, unexpected ways. Podcast Junkies. Podcast Junkies, episode 112. Welcome back. I'm Harry Duran, host of Podcast Junkies. Weekly shows, weekly conversations with engaging, fascinating, creative, outstanding podcasters who have incredible stories to tell, not only with their own show, but with their guests and I love how sometimes they just bring all facets of their personality into a show. And this week is no different. We have a conversation with Natalie Jennings. She's a photographer um, by day and a podcaster by night, I guess you could say. But she tells amazing stories with her show. It's called A Face Project. And we connected at Podcast Movement. So uh, what I thought was really interesting was the way she was repurposing content into a hardcover book or soft cover actually, but into a physical book. And she talks about that. And it was really something that I was uh, impressed by because obviously as a photographer, the quality of that book is going to be so much so much better than just a plain old ebook of transcripts. So we talk about how that was making the rounds at Podcast Movement, how we had some podcast adventures with the likes of some notable podcasters. And she talked a little bit about how she actually got a grant to help get her podcast started. And it's uh, really required listening for anyone looking for alternative ways to fund their podcast. In case you missed last week's episode, we spoke to Ashley Taylor Yanello. Ashley was a blast. <laughs> she just really tells it like it is. And uh, we met through Anchor, uh, an app, anchor.fm. So check that out. That's episode 111. Stay tuned to the end of the episode when I let you know what the retention hashtag is. It's a, it's a way for regular listeners of the show to tweet about the fact that they've made it all the way to the end of the episode. And it's really fun to see who pays attention and who's engaging with what episodes. And nine times out of 10, it's uh, my good friend Patrick with the first tweet of the day. So shout out to him again. This week's episode is brought to you by Podbean, our newest sponsor. I was checking out some of the stats on the site and I noticed that they had served 134,000 plus podcasters and delivered 3.4 million episodes and counting and 4.6 million, sorry, 4.6 billion downloads <laughs> as of today, which is bananas. And I think it just speaks to the fact that they're a rock solid platform. So if you have a need for your own podcast, for an enterprise podcast, or you're looking to do some crowdfunding for your podcast, I highly recommend you give them a shot. The first 30 days are free. Head on over to podbean.com slash podcast junkies and uh, take a look at all the services they're providing for podcasters to get started with their show. Okay, take two. Take two. <laughs> so Natalie Jennings, thank you so much for joining me on Podcast Junkies. Of course. Thanks for having me. So I like to start every episode with some... Uh, background on how I met my guest. And in this case, uh, people are probably getting tired of hearing that I just meet people at Podcast Movement and I drag them onto my show. <laughs> so um, that's where we met. And funny enough, you actually saw my PMX talk. And, I did. And given the uh, limited audience that you, that usually gets, it was <laughs> funny that um, that was your first introduction to Podcast Junkies. It was. It was my first introduction to podcast movement talks in general. I it was the first talk I saw. Wow, I think you have to. If I think about it now, I probably the bar was set pretty high or or, or pretty low. I'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> which one, because uh, if that's your first experience, you're like, wow, this sucks. This is the conference I came to. Well, you did make everyone stand up and stretch and touch each other. <laughs> I, th I think you might want to provide a bit more uh, context to that. Or otherwise, people are going to think that the this is going to go down some really strange path. <laughs> yeah, I think it was like, was it back rubs or high fives or something? It was really just karate like karate chop massages. Oh, right. Yeah. 
Right. That's the distinction we're looking for. Karate chop massages for your neighbor. I think it was to sort of get everyone up and moving and engaged in your talk. And uh, from your reaction, slightly annoy people in the process. (laughs) I think people understood where you were going with it, but I think after long travel days and first thing in the morning, people might not have had their coffee yet. So So how close was I to... Uh, were you to leaving the room at that point? <laughs> oh, I was way too comfortable to leave. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. So the uh, is that, does, it, does anything stand out from that talk I gave? Because I always wonder about that. We just have like, I think it's 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And so it's, I'm always thinking beforehand, like what can I talk about that'll resonate with people that they haven't heard or they're not going to hear from everyone here, oh, everyone else here at this conference. So I'm wondering now that it's been probably been about three months, is it three months? August, September? Yeah, close to three months, if anything has stuck with you from that talk. That requires me to backtrack a lot, but I think uh, one of the things that you talked about was treating your, your, your not your clients, but your um, interviewees well, which I think is an important thing to do. I don't remember your follow-up on that, but... <laughs> That's I followed it up with the massage with the karate chop massage. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's also a lot of call and response in your talk that sticks out, which is not sort of a takeaway. It's just a memory of you saying podcast. When I say, when I say podcast, you say junkie. It's, it's, it is an interesting thing because it's something that I've been learning as I've been working with business coaches and people that help you had a. Um, put together talks, even if it's for a short period of time, you really have to do something really quick in the beginning to establish a connection with the audience or else you're going to lose them. And part of it is actually this call and response of having them engage with you early on. And what it does from a psychological perspective, it makes them pay attention more because they feel like, oh shit, this is interactive. And I, and I, t- I need to sit up straight because I might be called upon or I, I, you know, I maybe ask the question. So I think, and then internally for you as a listener, I think it makes you um, pay attention more or be more alert. So hopefully it had that effect. Yeah, I think you did a really good job. I think it was a really engaging talk and it was a good way to start off the morning. So there'll be no, um, like, calisthenics required for this interview so you can you know there's nothing uh, this is about as interactive as it's gonna get <laughs> okay all right <laughs> so all right don't, don't, i can i can sit here yeah so what so talk about your your thoughts about podcast movement because this is your first podcasting conference right yeah it was my first one i i actually i was in new york city doing an interview for my podcast and i think something came up on social media and i had seen it before and I just clicked on it and sort of looked at it and realized it was a week later. And I just literally like on a whim bought my ticket and decided to go sort of last minute. Are you the type of person that typically makes decisions on the whim? Yeah, sometimes I think so. I think I'm up for things. Um, I like to think that I'm up for whatever life brings my way and I don't, I don't hold fast to to decisions I make weeks before or days before if something great comes up and shakes things up a little bit. But um, yeah, I'm really glad that I went. It was a really good conference and a lot of really great people. I think I think I said this to a number of people when I was there, but the attitudes and the camaraderie and just the general lack of sort of ego, I guess is the best word, was really surprising. Everyone was really friendly. really interested in each other's work and not that other conferences aren't like that. I've been to a number of photography conferences, um, but this one was, was just, it, that really resonated with me and it was something that I, I took away from it was how great the group of people were. How about the, I, I know it's a mix of talks and breakout sessions. Did you have something in mind that you wanted to get out of it when you showed up? I had kind of a laundry list of stuff because my podcast is relatively new. So I think I think a big portion of what I was looking into was a lot of sort of technical stuff, just understanding understanding stuff about the production and of podcasting, 
um, hosting website stuff, just, just a lot of the technical stuff. And then, um, I was really just interested in seeing who was there, meeting people, networking, and kind of trying out a whole bunch of different topics and, and talks and seeing what came out of it. Did you make any new connections as a result of spending three days there? Yeah, definitely. Um, sort of a couple of weeks afterwards, I was on another podcast um, and talked a little bit about it, my photo business and how to build a successful business, um, which is my main job. So that was a lot of fun. I've, I've stayed in touch with quite a few people that have um, podcasts and and I think that this medium really lends itself well to to staying in touch because we all like to uh, to talk. So, <laughs> so how does a photographer end up becoming a podcaster? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm a wedding and portrait photographer by trade, so that's my full time job. And a few years ago, I was in a position where I really wanted to do more creative work with my photography, just get away from weddings every weekend and that kind of stuff. And kind of like the humans of New York thing, I wanted to do some really nice portraits of people and hear, hear their stories and hear what they had to say and, um, put a little more, more depth and effort into to the telling of the story. So, you know, a long interview and, and a, a series of portraits. And so I started, um, I started what is now a face project that way. Uh, so for people that don't know, can you explain Humans of New York? Yeah, Humans of New York is, um, it's become kind of a social media giant, but essentially um, it's a photograph and a quote of uh, taken of folks that live in New York. So it's a snapshot of a person or a, a, a group of people or generally just one person. And then um, that person is asked a question. And then um, the quote, just like a caption to the photo, is posted with the photograph. Um, I think the momentum was really gained on Facebook. I think it's like well suited for that for that format. And um, now I think he has um, you know hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of followers. What is it about what he's doing with humans in New York that uh, that you're drawn to, and that you because you said you based your show loosely on that and so what is it about that about what he's doing with humans in new york that's attractive to you um i think we have this sort of built-in judgment thing as humans and we are conditioned to make assumptions about people and what we see on the surface and i think one of the things that's most compelling and sometimes even startling about his work is, is we do that naturally. So we'll see a photograph of somebody and immediately make a, a number of assumptions or judgments about what might be going on in the photograph or with that person. And a lot of the times the response that the people give is, is just surprising or different, or um, there's some depth to the character that maybe didn't lend itself to what you see in the photograph. So I think it's, um, I think it's, it's just always interesting and surprising to see what kind of perspectives people have in life. So were you listening to podcasts that did something similar as well? Because we'll talk in a minute about the actual style you've chosen for your, or the format you've chosen for your episodes. Yeah, of course I've been like a huge NPR fan for a long time. So a lot of the sort of big hitters, so to speak in the podcast world, um, I, I listen to, I mean, Serial and Startup and um, Criminal and a, a lot of those other ones. The Moth was a huge inspiration for me because the idea behind The Moth is stories told live in front of people without notes. Um, and so sort of take out the stage element and the live element. And that's very similar to what, what I'm doing now. And um, I used to go to Moth events and that was always really fun to, to sort of see it in person and, um, and listen to it later. So, yeah, those... Those shows were a huge, huge inspiration for me. So I, um, listen, regular listeners will know that I had Leah Tao on, who has a podcast called Strangers, but Leah Tao also used to be the producer for The Moth for a while now. And I had heard of that, and I never went to a show. And it's funny enough, we have a, um, an event space literally walking distance from us down the street, and there's, there's always like the sign that says The Moth, every, third Tuesdays or every month or something like that. And I'm like... Oh, we should go. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. It's really fun. You yeah, should yeah, go. Yeah. yeah. My wife's like, oh, we should go to the moth. I'm like, yeah, let's put it on the calendar. And we never go. But I, yeah. I did. So I, I was familiar with the concept. And actually in um, the last podcast movement, when Leah Tao spoke, she had a, a workshop where she was inviting people up to, to talk moth style. And uh-huh. so I was like, oh, I got a story. <laughs> so <laughs> it's one of those things where you raise your hand and you hope they don't pick you, but you kind of do it so you get out of your comfort zone. And she did pick me. And I think she put names in the hat and I got up to tell a story about something that happened when I used to live in Atlanta. And uh, it's really interesting. And it's and obviously it comes around to this topic of storytelling, which is really big in podcasting now. Like everyone's harping on tell a story, tell a story because it keeps people more engaged. And I think it allows people to connect more closely with the subject matter. Yeah, definitely. Well, storytelling is sort of everywhere now in business and in, um, you can kind of look anywhere and it just seems the word itself on social media just crops up. Uh, I think it's, I think it's a huge part of like the fabric of how humans understand life. So with all that inspiration, can you talk a little bit about the, the, the format that you finalized or you settled on for your show? Yeah, yeah. Well, initially, I had this idea as a photographer, I wanted to take a number of portraits of these storytellers. And so I compiled the portraits along with the audio of the interview that I did with them into this slideshow format. So people would sort of sit down and click play and watch the slideshow, listen to the audio. And then, um, then that content was repurposed into a magazine. So there'd be photos and then a transcript of the interview. And this was sort of requirements that I had. I I won a grant from the Minnesota State Arts Board and had to do, you know, a print version. And that's kind of how the magazine that I currently am am publishing was born. Um, But I found that the format was just not that accessible. And this is almost four years ago now. And so even, even though that doesn't seem like that long ago, a lot of people didn't have super smart phones and the, the kind of access to, uh, to the things that we do now. So, um, I, uh, I sort of transformed that, that process into just, I thought a podcast would be a really accessible, great way for people to hear the audio. And then on the website and in the magazine, if folks are interested in looking at a series of photographs of these storytellers, then, then they can do that, um, on, on their own time without having to, you know, park themselves in front of the screen for the whole, of the audio interview. Are the slideshows still available? Did you put those on YouTube? Um, there are uh, a couple still floating around out there, but I, when we relaunched in, uh, in March of 2016, I was trying pretty hard to sort of do a, a, a clean rebrand and just kind of get the, the idea of the podcast out there. How many iterations did you go through before you decided on the name? A face project. <laughs> Um, (laughs) I know it's like, people are like, oh, face project, huh? Um, it, you know, it's really bizarre about that is I bought the domain of faceproject.com. I had a face project on like a post-it note sitting by my desk for probably about six months before I did anything with it. And, uh, the name just, it's one of those weird things. It just kind of popped into my head and wouldn't leave. I, I brainstorm stuff. I try and do something different and I always came back to it and, um, and it just stuck, and I had I had purchased its domain, and it was sitting there. And my husband was just like, "You need to like do something with this because it's a good idea." And so the very first story, which is in the in the uh, first issue of the magazine, is um, him shaving his beard off. So he was like, "I'm going to shave my beard off. Why don't you just take pictures of it and ask me about it?" So, so I did. So I took a series of photographs of this process. He had been growing out this huge like beard for Movember and all that stuff. And, and then I asked him about it, like why he was doing it and how he felt once it was done and put that together in a slideshow. And that was actually the slideshow that won the grant. And then, um, and then when we relaunched, I put that transcription and those photos in volume one, issue one of the magazine from this year. So. Very cool. Uh, Yeah. Uh, Um, Let's talk about the grant because you mentioned this at, uh, at Podcast Movement. And obviously, there's so many podcasters that are just getting started and they're all doing it on their own, bootstrapping it. And, you know, they get frustrated because, you know, there's a limited pool of resources. They have their nine to five job and they, they, you know, there's, they realize as they get started, there's money to be invested in equipment and people to edit your audio. And then where are you going to have people to help you with social media and all these things that you don't think about as a podcaster. Um, but then that 
come to light after you go to a conference and you see what other people are doing and you're like yeah. oh shit i gotta get my act together <laughs> and so yeah. and so like um but you had the benefit of getting a, a grant and, and not a lot of podcasters have that um so i'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that process for folks that are listening that are going to be doing a show that it's that's in the same vein of what you're doing to see if maybe there's an untapped resource that they're not looking into that they should maybe see if uh, there's an option for them to get a, a grant for their show yeah, totally. Um, I'm not, I can't speak to how readily available grant money is for podcasters specifically, but I know that when I was seeking out grant money, I was just bowled over by how much money there is out there. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of money floating around for artists. And, uh, I think, um, one of the best things that I did is there's a community, um, group in, in the Twin Cities here called Springboard for the Arts. And I sought out help from them to shape my proposal. And, you know, I'd never really written a grant myself before. Um, and it, I mean, it was invaluable and they were really, really helpful. And so that process was long and tedious. And I think one of the things that surprised me the most is that there's just a, there's a very specific kind of language that they're looking for in those grant proposals. I don't know if it's for ease of going through them or, or, or why, but um, that's something to be familiar with and to, to sort of look into if you're going to try and spend the, the tremendous amount of time it takes to put a grant together. Um, but once you kind of get a handle on the language and, and how it's pieced together, um, it's a pretty easy thing to sort of take that content and throw it at a couple of other grants. You know, there's, it's easy to search for grants. Um, there's, gosh, there's just so many out there. And I think people are sort of, I think they're just thrown off by how much time they're kind of a daunting thing to, to dive into. And, um, you know, but like I said, if you, if you can get a little bit of help or just do a little bit of research, it, it ends up coming together pretty easily in the end. Are there any, uh, broad websites that we could direct people to, to get the process started or where, where you were looking for, or, or are there only sites that you were using that were specific to Minnesota? Yeah. Off the top of my head, I don't have any that I can even pinpoint because the Minnesota state arts board just has like links. And, um, I think every state is going to have something similar, you know, an arts board. Um, and then there's like a bajillion of them from, you know, the national science foundation to, I mean, you can just kind of go all over the place. There's one that I'm currently working on to go to Antarctica. And that's like, I would love to do interviews of folks down there. And, um, that's through the national science foundation. So that's not really a place you would think to even look as a podcaster doing stories and photos. But, um, I think just like keeping your options open and, and just, you know, maybe having a specific idea of what your goals are and what your budget is and what you want to do. And that might help guide you through the incredible ocean of, you know, money and resources that is the grant world. Are you gonna have to make any adjustments to your mobile recording setup if you go to Antar Antarctica? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, maybe. Uh, although I do have like a, yeah, I probably will. Um, how much did you end up uh, getting from the grant? 10,000. So to folks who are listening, $10,000 to help get your podcast off the ground um, is amazing. And I think it's very inspirational. And I think just the fact that you can have a number like that as something to aspire to hopefully motivates people, you know, to to even look for these resources because this is this is money that was going to go to someone, right? Someone in the creative space that was putting together an idea and that was able to articulate their vision for what they wanted to produce. And you did that well enough to get the grant. And I think a lot of people sometimes think that, oh, who's going to buy into my idea or no one thinks it's a good idea or I shouldn't even waste my time. And I think, you know, you're a, an ideal case for showing that if you do put the time in um, and it is something that's important to you, then it, it would be, a, it's a great way to help you get started and not having, and not have to be stressed about the, the things that typical podcasts are stressed about. Like, how am I going to pay for someone to edit my audio? Like, how am I going to get help for this and for the website and whatever else, you know, however you, however, however else you're allocating <laughs> the resources. That's, that was a tough one. Um, you know, it helps you th I, I would imagine like your your brain power is focused on the content, right? And how are you going to create these episodes and not these other things, at least for the short term until you can figure out, you know, where your next step is going to be. But I think, um, I think it's something that makes a lot of sense and people should put the time into it. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's a really wonderful community to be supported by and be a part of because they're, it's just money for artists and people who want to create things. And in the process of doing the grant, one of the things that is beneficial or I found beneficial was that you do really have to itemize everything and you have to propose exactly how much money you're planning to spend on what very specifically. And just in doing that exercise, it really, really helps you think about what you're actually doing and how you're doing it and where you want to go with it. And little tiny ideas are kind of born from that process because you think like, oh, maybe I could, you know, hire someone to do this or, or whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, I highly encourage anyone that's feeling kind of stuck um, or even if you're just trying to shape what you're doing, you know, maybe maybe throw it at a grant and see how how it sort of how you can parse it out in on paper and, and you might get some more clarity about, about what you're doing. So when you came up with the name and you knew that this was going to be a podcast, I'm sorry, I'm harping, harping on the name here, but it would just make, I would think logically speaking that it would make sense that it would be called a voice project. Yeah. 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 You, you bring up a good point there. Um, I know, as I said, for whatever reason, a face project just kept popping up and, and I think at, you know, I was very, uh, portrait and photography focused, yeah. no pun intended. So I, uh, I think this vision of having these portraits of these people, um, with their voice was, or, or some of the, some of the photographs are sort of action shots or kind of photojournalistic shots of, of people in their, in a familiar space. Um, and we recently published an episode about a boxer. So we were at the gym and I was taking photos while he was boxing. So there's a, there's, there's a mix of photos, but that was sort of what was going on in my head is just this, this idea of, of faces and how everybody, you know, behind every face is, is kind of the story. And I don't know, I really, <laughs> I, I have no idea why. And I still, you know, I believe it, when we rebranded and relaunched in March, I spent a huge amount of time, probably more time than I needed to on, on brainstorming names and, and it just, I, this one is just the one. <laughs> well, I think, I think, I think in, in hindsight, it makes sense when you think about what your vision was for not only the podcast, but what you're doing in conjunction with the podcast, the magazine, uh, the website, the photos you're taking, um, you may at even some point incorporate video, um, into the mix. And so, now it seems to make perfect sense, and it seems like wow, that's that was a perfectly selected name for the show because it, it it encapsulates what you're trying to do. You're trying to put a face. You're trying to put a face to the voice. Yeah, no, you're right, and that's that's kind of you mentioned the magazine, and we have a quarterly magazine that comes out um, featuring all the transcripts of the stories and stuff. And that when you have that in your hand, um, that's really when <laughs> the name seems to make a lot more sense. But. Um, yeah. <laughs> so so let's talk about the magazine because uh, we had a couple of apparently I was I was I hired myself as your PR agent during those couple <laughs> of days because I saw the magazine and I'm like what I'm like this is yeah. amazing and well, it's would... and it's so, sorry to cut you off but I mean it's, it's funny because I'm a huge fan of repurposing content and I haven't done it obviously to that extent but I've taken the first 25 episodes and I made an ebook called around the camp around the podcast campfire. Um, and I always, I love this idea of taking something that you've already put a lot of, you know, blood, sweat and tears into, you know, this podcast episode, this audio. And then the fact that you were taking pictures at the time, it just makes sense that like to, to think about how else do I tell these, you know, these folks stories in a way that puts them in the best light possible. And, and coming from that photography background, I, I, I imagine that had a lot of influence in, in taking that step and i'm wondering if from the beginning you knew that that was going to be a component for the show the the magazine was always um because it was part of the grant it was always kind of lurking in the background um before i even knew we were going to have a podcast um and i i think you're right i think that um it's it's a really great way to repurpose content and i found that um there are a lot of people or fans i guess of the show that really like the magazine that aren't even really podcast listeners. So, um, so I, I it offers people that are interested in these stories, just a, a totally different way to, to experience them. And I'm a, I'm a huge fan of like things that you don't have to plug in. I like to read books and listen to, you know, well, I guess you have to plug in a record player, but you know, like I, I think that 
everything, everything is so digitized now. And, and just being able to, to pick something up that's tangible is really special. And as a photographer, uh, because of all, all of the digitized digital, whatever, you don't often get to see your work in print. And, um, I rarely get to see my work in print. If I go to a client's house or something and they have something on the wall, it's always really exciting because I feel like I spend way too much time looking at a screen every day. So, um, but yeah, I would bump in you every now and then at the, at the conference and you'd be like, Hey, bring that magazine out, you know? (laughs) Well, we actually got, we actually got in front of, uh, several notable podcasters. That's right. That's right. We did. That's right. <laughs> not, that, no, was- not that we want to name drop, but um, you want to talk about some of the adventures you had uh, in terms of the, let's talk about the limo ride, because <laughs> that's the one I'm alluding to. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how that happened, because I just sort of got stuck, and I just met, it was Christina Cancers who I had just met, and we, for whatever reason, really liked each other, and just decided that we were going to hang out for the night, and you were there and there were just a handful of people and somebody had organized a limo taxi to go get noodles somewhere in Chicago. And from there it just led to donuts and weird bars. And like, I mean, it was just, it was like a, in the speakeasy, we went all over with this group of us, um, had just a really, really wonderful night. So that, that's actually, that speaks to how much fun that conference was in the, in the sense of like inclusion and people just being, open to what everyone else is doing. Cause you're right. There were some pretty well-known podcasters hanging out with us that night. And like that whole, just like ego thing and whatever, it's just kind of goes away. And, and I don't know if you always get that, um, in every circle. So I, I really had a lot of fun. For those of you that are regular listeners, I, I, I'll have to say, I, she, um, Natalie doesn't want to mention who <laughs> I think who was there, but it was, uh, actually Andrew Warner who, hailed the uh the limo for us which oh, is yeah. which is so 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 random because i think he tried to find an uber and he couldn't find one he's like oh, i got a limo instead and we're like okay let's do that <laughs> so uh, vernon foster was there uh kimberly rich was there um nico johnson was there um and i, I just interviewed nico as well so it's it's a little fun to get his take on um the night and then um we ended up rendezvousing with uh, john lee dumas of all people <laughs> yeah yeah and, um, yeah, he, there was, who else? There was a couple other people there. Um, yeah, it was great fun. Yeah. So it was, yeah, it's, it's one of those things like, it, I would imagine that you didn't even think like that was going to be possible as you were like registering for podcast movement. You're like, Oh, you know, stodgy podcast conference, attend some sessions and then I'll, you know, have, uh, quiet nights in my room, like reading my pamphlet or something like that (laughs) yeah the stack of pamphlets (laughs) that you inevitably come home with that that yeah sit on your desk for a long time um no it was well worth it it was a lot of fun so i'm really glad that glad that that happened (laughs) and it's just goes uh, for people who haven't thought of going to a conference i think there's there's i love going i mean for me that's my tribe i've been three years in a row Um, for people who have seen me there before know that I have no problem with shameless self-promotion. So <laughs> I'm a big fan of uh, rocking the super bright orange Podcast Junkies shirt. Um, it's it, yellow. It's, it's sort yellow. of like an orange yellow, yeah. Uh, mm. What's inter- what was fo- so funny is I actually know the, the hex code. Like, you know, when you're looking for a specific color on a website, there's a pound sign and then like a mm-hmm. six-digit number. So the the hex code for that yellow is FCB twenty one C, and I, I've now memorized it because <laughs> there you go, everyone. <laughs> so I, uh, you can't use that color anywhere in your p- future <laughs> podcast plans. So don't even try it. Um, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> it's so <laughs> weird, random. Um, trademarking my podcast color on the air. So. <laughs> um, but the reason I bring, bring up self-promotion is because like why I was giving you a bit of grief, like every time you had the book, when I saw it, it was amazing because for those of you who can't uh, see the book right now, they can go to the website. We'll provide links at the end of the show. But it's a beautifully like um, laid out book and it's I, I love the, the size of it and then the way the colors are presented. And obviously, you can see your um, photography influence on it. And I just thought the whole book was just incredibly well done. And I was just surprised when you would be talking to people about your show, like, when is she going to pull out the book? Like, when is she going to pull out the book? Like, pull out the book. And I'm like, hey, aren't you the one with the book? Like, pull out the book. Like, And then, then when John Lee Dumas showed up, I'm like, 
um, show Johnny do Mr. Book, you know, because he was like, so, you know, I think, and, and I don't know, I'm, I'm wondering if that's like part of your nature to like not be this just crazy self promotion, or is this something you're finding you're having to do now more that you have a podcast? Yeah, well, that's a that's been a huge hurdle for me in in both my photo business and this is that I uh, I have a hard time sharing stuff about myself in you know a social media kind of way. I mean, I I have a Facebook account that kind of thing, and I'll occasionally post personal things, but I always feel just a little bit weird doing it, and I don't I don't know why. Um, so yeah, just that sort of shameless self promotion kind of like thing. Um, it's not that I wouldn't i mean i'm talking to you right now <laughs> <laughs> i was just about to say because if you're prop with self-promotion and talking about yourself then jumping on a podcast interview show yeah. might not be the best thing for you no i mean i've obviously obviously um i've gotten over some of those hurdles but it's certainly intrinsically not a thing that i like do um and so um i appreciate what you say about the the magazine um it is kind of I call it a magazine because it's a quarterly, but it is like a book and it's definitely a lot of, a lot of work goes into it. My, um, good friend and like right arm of the podcast, uh, Aaron Woods, he's a brilliant designer and he does all the layouts. Um, we work closely together, but he ultimately is the one that pieces these things together. And, uh, yeah, they're like 10 by 10. So they're square, which is kind of a nice, um, a nice little, um, twist, I got not a twist, but it's just a, a unusual size for a periodical and, um, usually about a hundred pages or so. So it's, it's nice. It's, um, uh, once again, a great way to repurpose content and, and get, get stuff out there. So have you had any luck or are you looking to get that physical copy of the book in, in front of other markets or any, any other audiences? Yeah, yeah. I just I just uh, interviewed and, and hired someone to sort of do marketing sales stuff, which is a really exciting step. And um, we're we're proposing some really large distribution stuff to some to some big companies, and uh, just crossing our fingers and hoping that hoping that getting getting it out there will. I mean, I for me, this project has just become such a labor of love because I believe so much in what we're doing and telling a story and giving people a platform to just tell a story that doesn't have some sort of weird media slant or, um, I don't know, just in, we're sort of living in this strange era where news is everywhere and, and the media is just, it just feels almost like poisonous. And I, I think that being in a publishing industry, um, and being able to just tell these stories and get them in front of people. I, you know, I have had emails that have, I, and I save them in a folder that, you know, where somebody's story is, has drastically changed someone's life. And, and when those come in, it's, you know, the work is like, doesn't even matter. It's, it's just so worth it. And, um, so yeah, I, I would really like the ability to, um, support a small staff and, and, make some money because I don't pay myself right now, which I probably should. But um, <clears throat> I really, really believe in the project's ability to give the people that are interviewed a voice as well as really impact, you know, our understanding of, of the human experience. So the, the, the actual format is called First Person Narrative. Is that right? Yeah, it's so the way that the podcasts themselves are edited, um, they're sort of bookended by me blabbing about, you know, whatever I'm hosting it, but I'm not, it's not an interview style. So when I, when I conduct the interviews, um, and then go into production, I cut myself out completely. So what's transcribed into the magazine and what you hear is just, it's very much like the moth. So someone just standing there, um, in like in the moth setting, they're on stage talking to an audience, um, in, in a face project setting, it's sort of an introduction piece and then their voice. Um, and, and I think that what draws me to that style of production is just, just the intimacy. I mean, you really feel like someone's talking to you and you can really focus in on their story, their voice, um, the cadence of the way they speak. And, uh, it's almost like they're just sort of right there with you without me being like, so, you know, Tell me about. I just think that these is that stories the, is that are... the voice you use during your interviews? <laughs> yeah, talk like this. I can understand um, why you cut those out. <laughs> no, I think that uh, the nature of a lot of these stories is really, really personal. Um, 
had stories about suicide and mental health and, you know, World War II survivors. And, and some of these, some of these um, topics you, are, are really emotional for the storyteller. It's really hard for people to sort of process and, and get out um, while we're doing the interview. And I, I think just giving them that space to think through and not feel pressured to get it right the first time and, and just kind of um, tell their story has, has been, I don't know, I'm really drawn to that. And I think it, it shows in the, the final product, um, just a little bit of a different, different vibe. Is that a learned skill, this idea of, because interviewing is, you know, something that I've been learning a lot about over the past two and a half years, because it's the nature of my show. And I'm wondering if it's something that you've done before, or as you've worked through the podcast, and you've had these episodes recorded, um, if you found that it's a, a skill you're just trying to get better at. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I definitely, especially when I listen back to myself, like probably when I listen to this or when I listen to the raw audio, I'm always just not annoyed with myself, but just there's a million ways where I know I could have said something better, been more articulate or whatever. Um, so of course I'm always trying to, to get better at, at interviewing, but I think when it comes down to production for me, um, it's, it's all about storytelling and I have, um, my undergraduate degree is uh, part of it is in creative writing. The other parts in Hawaiian language, which I don't really use. <laughs> That's the next podcast. <laughs> Not really using a lot, but <laughs> but uh, the sort of story arc is something that I I spend a lot of time on, you know, um, and making sure there's you know exposition and rising action and and a climax and all that kind of stuff because. Um, because that's what makes for a great story. So, um, whether, so there are times where I think of stuff, um, towards the end of an interview and, or even stuff comes out right away at the beginning of an interview. And I know where in that story arc, I'm going to put it because, um, because that's part of telling a story. (laughs) (laughs) So, well, I'm, I'm wondering if you're thinking about these things as you're doing, I think you alluded to it that you are, but I'm wondering how much of it is present in the process of the actual interview. You know, I, I, not, not too often. I, I don't plan too much because these stories really have their own sort of, um, legs. They just wander around and go every which way. Um, sometimes in the most beautiful, unexpected ways. Um, sometimes I do have to, you know, take a little bit more control and, and bring people back into the, to the sort of plot line, so to speak, or the narrative, because it's easy to be tangential and just kind of go, go, go. But, um, so I do have an idea when I, when I have my first emails and sort of pre-interviews with people, what, what are the sort of talking points? But if, if they say something that we hadn't even touched on and it's, it's brilliant, I'll just let it go. Cause it's, um, sometimes, and especially like, I'm sure you get this too, at the very end of an interview, when I've said to people like, that was a great interview. Thanks so much. The next few things they say are usually some of the best sound bites of the whole interview because, they sort of reiterate or, or, or revisit things that they they enjoyed from the interview or or I wish I would have said this or man that part about you know and it's those moments are just are fantastic so yeah I think it's something about human nature because I some I, what I've started to do is just start recording right away with these Skype interviews and people are relaxed they're like okay let me know when we're gonna start I'm like we started <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and you could see like the change in them like they feel like it's this idea of being on the air I think that freaks people out or having your conversation yeah. recorded yeah. and I think people want to always put their best foot forward or uh, best uh, voice forward and I think it's weird how they change. And like you said, when I, when I say, okay, I'm going to stop recording, I'm going to stop the recording, the official recording. And then we keep talking afterwards and we <laughs> inevitably talk about some cool stuff. And I'm like, Hmm. And then, uh, I'm wondering if I should tell people I, I'm stopping to record, but don't stop recording. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that, I don't know. That's always a tough one too. But I, like in my case, usually it's in person. So people have the lapel mic on and, and stuff like that. But, um, even in my years of, I, I've a number of years as a like in radio and had my own show and like I still will probably right now I still stutter and just you, you just you notice that you're being recorded and and um, it does take people a little while to sort of um, relax into that. You know, it's interesting that it's because it sounds so scripted at times when you hear these interview shows like that people are reading questions and people already know what they're going to answer. I think as a listener 
there's part of you that doesn't re- resonate as much with it when you feel like there's some um, scripting happening and it's not natural. Like, for example, one of my episodes that had been getting a lot of um, good comments is the one with Chase Reeves, episode 100. And I think it's because I literally started recording. Well, I knew it was, I always start recording when I start a Skype session. And I just said, like, how the F are you, man? And and then <laughs> that had to be, it was an, one of my more explicit shows just because that's how Chase is. And um, I went with it. And it was, you could just tell it was just a free-flowing, nonstop conversation for like almost an hour and a half. And I think people resonated with that. And so I think I'm, I'm trying to do that more and more often um, because people hear that and they say, oh, that just sounds like a, a fun conversation that I'd like to eaves, eavesdrop in on. Yeah. Well, I listened to that episode and I, and I know exactly what you're talking about. I think that just being real and just being authentic is really appealing to people. And that's sort of my biggest hurdle currently uh, with what I'm doing is I'm I'm trying a little bit harder to just relax a little bit when I'm doing my intros and outros and just be a little bit more myself and try to balance that with, you know, the high production value of the interview sort of puts a little pressure on me. You know, it wouldn't match up if I was just like winging it all the time. And, you know, so I have to plan a little bit because that's the tone of the show. But um, I also am totally drawn to to authenticity and just people yeah like just being like how the hell are you um and so that's that's been sort of a a recent like thing that i'm i'm going through with with the podcast as it as it evolves so maybe we just need to drop some more f-bombs in this conversation so it's just yeah yeah it sounds like a great idea random f-bombs so where does the uh creative spark in you like come from like what else because it I get the feeling that this is not the only thing that's uh, creative in your life. Yeah, I mean, where does it come from? That's a question for the ages. I don't know, but I, uh, I, I've always been into art since I was a little kid. Drawing was I actually so my like dream thing until I was like twelve years old was to work as a cartoonist for Disney. I used to just draw all the time, just draw, draw, draw. Uh, so visual art, photography, like that, kind of came naturally to me and. Um, I think art inspires other arts. So I'm a big reader and writer. I play music and it's just, I think, um, you know, I can be playing guitar and just sitting in the living room and then just be reminded of like a, a poem or or something. I don't know. I, I do think it's all connected in some way. And, um, so the more that I do uh, or make art, um, whether it's like even just like knitting or creating anything, um, I feel like that, that feeds, feeds my passion for, for life and what inspires me um it's almost like practicing art like you're practicing being not practicing being inspired but the more you do it the Mm. more comes out of it and then you get led into other avenues of art and i think it's just my life has always been infused with some sort of creative process i guess it's the idea of the it being a, a, a muscle that the more you use it the more it sort of works its way into your life (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah a muscle <laughs> <laughs> creative muscle you never heard that before it's a very it's a very common phrase you can, go, you can google it what's your uh so what's your favorite disney movie oh well oh man i mean that's a tough question let me think about that for a minute we'll come back to that one there's so many well if you so- if you if you start not answering questions, they're just going to pile up at the end, just so you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can we hold off on that and that and that? Uh, and then I'm like, not, okay. I don't have a, you know, I probably like. Without thinking about it too much. Probably The Little Mermaid because okay. I love the ocean stuff. So there you go. I'll See? Fish. I wasn't. I don't like, really like the above land stuff. I like the the <laughs> the, the, the in, in the water stuff. Okay. I so, okay, so that, just, that just opens up a whole new can of worms there. So. <laughs> yeah, let's. <laughs> what. What do do you like about Below Land, like otherwise known as the sea? Under the sea. Under the mm-hmm. sea. Under the sea. That's right. Keeping mm-hmm. in Disney form here. Um, so you're a big fan of ocean life, and yeah, yeah. Well, it, I lived in Hawaii a long time. That's where I went to school. So I was. I've always been drawn to the ocean. Um, growing up in Minnesota, uh, we have a ton of water, a lot of lakes, a lot of beautiful lakes. Some of them so big that it seems like you're at the ocean, but the ocean has always drawn me. And as far as that film goes, I, I can distinctly remember being fascinated by making something look like it's underwater. Just the way the light 
and the colors mm-hmm. are reflected on yeah, I'm mean, just little things that that are are actually really difficult to do. So that was that was sort of a little childhood obsession was just like, how do they do that? Um, yeah, and then as I grew up, I just um, I moved to Hawaii when I was 18 and lived there for a little over six years and uh, yeah, spent as much time as possible in the water. So very cool. So now that you've got uh, all this time and then you've re- rebranded the show um all the time under your belt with the podcast and now you've rebranded and you have an idea of what it is that you want the show to to sound like and, and to look like with the, with the book what's been the most surprising thing that maybe you didn't know or didn't expect when you first started um when you think about or when you the time when you first started the podcast Wow, that's a broad question. <laughs> um, surpri- well, I think if I were to be surprised by anything related to this is how much I absolutely love it and am, am totally moved by it. I'm just so, so, so inspired by the people that I have the privilege to interview. I mean, it's, it's just sitting in these very personal spaces with perfect strangers and 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 holding space while they just open up with these incredible sometimes I mean we have uplifting not so intense topics as well but but when we're covering some really dark stuff it's it's a special thing and I'm always very cognizant of it <clears throat> cognizant of it as it's happening that that this is a really incredible moment in time to be able to share with someone that that this person needs to get this out there wants to get this out there is volunteering their story which is how we get the majority of our interviews and and um, I I knew I enjoyed that, but I I never ever s- expected how you know how profoundly it would affect me in my life. So I've been asking a form of this next question to uh, some guests recently, and because when you when you talk about how this makes you feel and and the um, what you're getting out of all these episodes. I'm thinking about this in terms of like your life's work. Like, and I don't know if you think about things on, on that grand of a scale, but given how you've described how satisfied you are when you're producing this, this show, is this something like where you see, um, you'll be putting more of your effort in, in terms of like, you know, these goals that you have about where you want to be in life and the kind of impact you want to have, uh, in this world. Um, I'm wondering if, if you see that the podcast, or something related to the podcast playing a bigger role. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. I was just talking to a, a friend today over lunch, and I said out loud, "Like, I want to do this forever until I'm too old to do it." And I, I want to do this. I, this, I want this to be my life's work, and um, because I believe it's really good work, and I think that as we grow. I have a lot of ideas sort of in the back of my mind and on post-its scattered everywhere about, you know, being able to to take what we do and help others. I, I, I have an opportunity coming up in December to go uh, to Guatemala and use um, sort of my my skills as a photographer and a podcaster to to bring attention to to some work, medical work and clean water initiatives that are being done there. Um, and so I think that there's space for for these stories to evolve into, um, to just making the world a better place, which is always such a, a cheesy phrase, but I, I believe it's good work and I believe that has the potential to reach a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And I hope that, I just hope that I'm able to sustain it and, and do it for a long time. I hope so too. And, uh, it seems, it seems like, uh, you really found your calling here and, and I think, um, you know, you're, you're taking all these things that you've learned up until this point in your life and now applying all the different aspects of it into, into creating something that's uniquely you, right? Because if someone else tried to do a podcast, but they don't have the photography background or they don't play an instrument or, you know, they didn't have this passion for drawing, I think you would have, they could take the same subject and they could actually interview the same people and you would end up with a completely different product. Yeah, that's right. It's the same with photos. You know, you give someone a raw image and have them throw it in Photoshop and, Everyone's going to come back with something a little bit different. So, um, yeah, as long as people are enjoying it and I'm enjoying it and uh, it's making a positive impact, like I, I'll just keep keep rolling with what what's working and and 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. And yeah. And yeah. So, uh, okay, a couple more questions. What's the what's the one most most misunderstood thing about you? Ooh, misunderstood thing about me. That's a crazy question. I mean, it's not a crazy question. I just I don't know. But that's a really hard thing to to even be able to answer. Well, it may be something, you know, sometimes it's people see you in one aspect or maybe I've seen you from afar or just know you from the podcast and then they meet you and they're like, well, I thought you were like this. And so, so sometimes it's just sort of a probing question to kind of make you think. And, and everyone has answered it completely differently sometimes. And well, you know, that question was a lot easier to answer. So I had, I had dreadlocks for a long, long time and um, took a lot of pride in them, took really good care of them, but had some incredibly interesting experiences based on the stereotypes around that. Just, you mm. know, like people just treating me totally different than they treat me now. Maybe whether it was like, Hey, you got any weed or <laughs> like, or just not for whatever reason. And this was always insulting sort of in the back of my mind, but just not thinking that I was intelligent or had, I don't know, just like this, like sort of, I guess like dirty hippie kind of stereotype that people are like, you know, instead of asking me about, you know, interesting things we could talk about. It was like, so do you wash your hair, you know? And it's like, yeah, do you, you know, I don't know. So there's, you could sort of feel this like judgment from people a lot more than I feel it now in, in sort of the interactions I'd have and stuff like that. But that was, that was a, a little while ago. So nowadays, um, I don't, I don't know. No, that's I good. I mean, it's, well, it's interesting because the question prompted your thought about interactions you've had when you had the dreads so and that's an interesting take on it so thank you yeah <laughs> what, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> what have you changed your mind about recently um oof. wow these are like <laughs> these are really difficult questions what have i changed my mind about recently well i already touched on it but one of the big things that's been like related like in the the front of my mind is, is how I approach my podcast. Like I'm really trying to work at being more authentic and, and a little more candid and just natural, um, when I'm speaking and <clears throat> yeah. And that's, that's just like a huge challenge. And we, we only do two episodes a month, so I have time to think about it and time to work through each interview. But, um, because I love what I'm doing so much, like that's always on my mind. Like I, I need to change this and, and yeah. So that's one thing. Okay, we'll we'll lighten it up for the last one. When's the last time you laughed out loud? Oh, it's just now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just now. I like to laugh. I'm like always laughing pretty hard. I I I enjoy a good laugh. So okay. now, now, yeah. Well, Natalie Jennings, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, tell us a little bit more about the show. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it too. And so what's the best way for folks to track you down online? Yeah, everything is a face project. So on Twitter, a face project, Instagram, a face project, Facebook, a face project, and our website is a face project.com. So it's all pretty easy to remember. And uh, iTunes, face project, Google Play Music, Stitcher, all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, it's just that it's a face project everywhere. Um, and we have uh if you're interested in the magazine, digital or print versions, it's all on our website in our online store. Uh, so listeners, definitely go check out the podcast, check uh, fantastic episodes, and check out the book. The book is awesome. And I, <laughs> as you can tell from my ac activity at Podcast Movement and now, uh, I think it's a great idea and it's something that should um, get the creative juices flowing for people who are doing a podcast now and are thinking about what else to do with that content. So thanks again, and have a fantastic day. Thank you. So there was a lot to unpack in that episode, this idea of repurposing, this idea of getting funding for your show, this idea of being a creative in one aspect of your life and using that in combination with your other skill sets to put together this new idea, this, this podcast, which Natalie's done so successfully. So I highly encourage you to see what she's doing. Head on over to afaceproject.com and you can see all the stuff we talked about, the the book, and actually order it and support her, which is always something I, I, I like to see listeners supporting previous guests. Don't forget to visit podbean.com slash podcast junkies. If you're thinking of starting a podcast or looking for a great home for your show, 
Don't forget, you'll get one month free if you sign up with the special URL and you can try all of Podbean's great hosting features. Podbean.com slash podcast junkies. Podcast Junkies is a member of Podcastica. Head on over to podcastica.com to see all the great shows that we have in our stable. Is that a thing? A podcast stable? Music is provided by Cedar and Soil. Head on over to cedarsoil.com. Don't forget to tune in next week. We have a conversation with Davey Rothbart, a fantastic storyteller. His podcast is on Wondery as well, um, similar to uh, Christine Blackburn's, who we had on a couple of weeks ago. And his podcast is called Found. USA Today says that Found makes you care about the lives of strangers. It's this. Uh, it was born out of a magazine that's been running for almost 10 years, and uh, about these pieces of paper that people would find or letters uh, uh, that were written by folks and and just discarded or or come across in someone's stash in an attic. And the magazine and then the podcast proceeds to track these people down and, and find out their stories and see where they are. It's really fascinating. I, I love the show. And uh, we have a great conversation with Davey, uh, also a resident of Los Angeles. So um, there seems to be a bit of a trend with that lately. But yeah, uh, tune in next week. It's episode 113. It's going to be exciting. So the retention hashtag for this week, calling back on what Natalie is doing with her her magazine and the stories she's telling, it, uh, we'll make it hashtag uh, Natalie Project. So N-A-T-A-L-I-E Project, that's the hashtag, and uh, copy her at A Face Project for on Twitter and uh, podcast underscore junkies. So thanks again for all your support, guys. Uh, week in, week out, you never cease to put a smile on my face. Um, from the comments, from the feedback, from uh, the speak pipe messages. It's been a little quiet the past couple of weeks, so I'm going to prompt you again. Head on over to podcastjunkies.com. You'll see the tab on the right-hand side. Uh, click on it and leave a quick recording for me. Let me know what you're thinking of the show, what you liked or didn't like, and I'll uh, rec- and I'll get it recorded. Well, it's already recorded. I'll get it posted up on the site. Do that now. Bye, y'all. Bye.